Um, welcome to the Dr. Medic Podcast and welcome to the studios, Peter. Um, thanks for coming all the way out from LA. Um, how do you say your last name again? It's Trono. Trono. Peter Trono from uh, Los Angeles, uh, air traffic control expert. Um, super stoked to have you here. Was Thank your flight, you. flight okay? Everything good with the Everything trip? Everything was really well... Uh well handled by Southwest. Folks. Good, good. I think that you dodged the tornadoes, man. We had a lot of tornadoes in the last couple of weeks, and uh, I was kind of worried. Good. I was worried about whether or not that was going to happen. I'm again. very thankful for that, but that was a pretty good thunderstorm we had last night. Yeah, yeah. It reminded me of one of those uh, those Florida thunderstorms that, that keep you up keep you up all night. Well, anyway, so um, Peter's here. Uh, because he's an air traffic controller, right? Or a history mm -hmm. of air traffic controller. So we'll right. let you tell us a little bit about yourself in a second. But um, we're we're going to be referencing this this the Kobe Bryant incident, right? And um, kind of beginning to end. Um, but for anybody that's listening or watching, uh, if you have not watched the um, the Kobe video on you on YouTube, uh, you probably should stop watching this right now. And I'll I'll put a link up top or in the in the description or something like that. Um, and watch that video first so that you have a, uh, um, a good understanding of just kind of the logistics of the, of the accident day and how everything went, uh, and then come back to this so that you can find out all the nightmare stuff that we might be talking about. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so, so what, what's your experience with air traffic control? What's, what's your, you're, you're, you're an expert of some sort. That's why you're here. Um, what are you an expert in? Yes, I'm an expert of some sort. So anyway, <laughs> I started back in seven, 1974 in the Air Force. So uh, that, if I do my math, I, I'm coming up on 50 years in aviation. So that's mm. uh, a little bit of time. Um, of course, uh, uh, my FAA career started in, in 1983. And in 83 um, was right after the strike, of course, the air traffic controller strike. So um it wasn't soon thereafter we organized a union in 86 and I became involved in that and got a safety position, became a safety a rep for LA center. Mm -hmm. And I believe I was the first uh, safety rep for LA center. And so I've been safety minded outcome driven for a number of years. Um, after that, I became the Western Pacific region safety rep, uh, did that for a number of years. Um, and then in 20, 01 became an air safety investigator and did that for about 11 years, just shy of 11 years, uh, mm. working with the NTSB on accident investigation. And I've got over a dozen accidents and incidences. Um, the incidences are great because there's no fatalities in those, of course. Mm. <laughs> but um, that's what I've got under my belt. After that, I started a consulting company. Um, I've got a, a, a couple of uh, international clients. And so that's my expertise in uh, yeah. In a, Reader's Digest version. Yeah, absolutely. So, so is, there's a definition difference between incident and accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And is uh, that, that's an FAA term? Right, yeah. What, what's the difference? An accident is, uh, is usually as a result of some damage to the aircraft or fatality or injury or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, an incident is uh, where the outcome was good and uh, we had an issue that almost caused uh, an, a, a crash. Like uh, I can recall one that is uh, done recently by the NTSB in Medford, Oregon, where the aircraft mm -hmm. got very low um, on approach to uh, Medford, Oregon, created a TAWS or jip whiz uh, alert. The aircraft had to climb abruptly and the, the um, NTSB did an investigation of that. And we may talk about that, you know, some other sure, time, but sure. that's, that's an incident. There's everybody. And so fine. when you were an, an air traffic controller, uh, what, what you, that was out of Los Angeles. Yeah. At a Los Angeles center, mm -hmm. uh, in the military, I was a tower controller and, an, uh, I worked a remote GCA, which is a ground controlled approach, which was kind of cool. It gave me some really good concepts about what, what radar is and basic surveillance. And this is going to be what we're going to be talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, uh, that was a, a really good, um, foundation for understanding surveillance systems. And then I went into what they call main base GCA. So I was a was kind of not quite an approach controller, but uh, mm -hmm. so but because uh, I didn't have that 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 title. But then I went into the FAA. They hired me, and of course I could have gone to any tower and probably checked out a little bit quicker because I had that experience. But of course the FAA, being what they are, they said no, you're going to go to a center, and uh, right. 
I found that to be a completely different experience. It's, and so what's the definition of a center? There's lots of centers across the United States. There sure are. And um, the best way to describe what a center does is uh, to flip a, um, a wedding cake on, upside down. So okay. a tower is the small piece. They control roughly about three miles around their, you know, it, it varies. Like the tower at the airport? At the airport, mm-hmm. right? They control the surface and airports landing and departing that air, at that airport. And, and some other things as well. Um, but that's their main operation. That's what they, um, are involved with. And uh, the second layer would be the terminal approach control facilities. Mm-hmm. That would be the radar facility that goes over the top of the tower. And some of these facilities, like the one we're going to be talking about today at SCT, Southern California Tracon, they're, uh, 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 an amalgamation of many very uh, locations like Burbank, Ontario, uh, San Diego, and so on and so forth. So they're all in one building. And so they uh, comprise a, a large bit of airspace, but it's not all the way, all the way up into the, you know, flight levels. It's uh, lower. So they go down, uh, you know, basically it's about to 17,000 feet. Mm-hmm. Some places is a little bit lower if it varies. And then on top of that is the en route center, the air traffic control center, which is what I worked at. There's 20 of them in the United States and, uh, they control all the flights, um, that are in, be- that are not covered by what I just talked about. Right, and sometimes right. we can, we control all the way to the ground, right? Because there's no intermediate, there's not a tower, there's not an approach control. And so we go all the way to the ground and all the way up into the flight level six zero zero and above. So, um, and so who, who are you, who are your, your primary, um, folks or aircraft or who, who's the primary people who you're surveilling as, as an air traffic controller? Well, uh, folks who are doing instrument flights. Yep. Yeah, part 91, um, uh, part 121, part 135. Um, uh, so all those are coming to the, um, in our jurisdiction, but mm-hmm. in, uh, VFR or VMC aircraft, IFR or IMC aircraft. Yeah. So we work them all. Mm-hmm. Um, um, there's no one we leave behind. Although we don't do much helicopter work, that's mostly in the terminal and tower environment. Right, right. right? Or they're just on their own. And oh, it, they're on their own. Right. right? Yep. Right. That's so, accurate. So you, you saw the Kobe video, I'm sure. Yes. Right? That's what brought us together. Yeah. And so the the um, just, just a little recap for people who um, uh, may, may, may have not watched it, and I'm just going to reca- recap with you. Um, but like I said, go back and watch the video and uh, you'll get a, a thorough understanding, maybe too much of an understanding as some people might say, um, uh, because it's a long video. It's, I think it's about 40 minutes, uh, but watch that video. But in short, you, you know, um, uh, Kobe Bryant, NBA star, whatever lives in, lives in Los Angeles. And he, um, has, uh, towards the, after his career, his NBA career is over, he lives down in uh, um, very southern part of Los Angeles, and but he's got this Mamba Sports Academy up in Camarillo. Did I say that right? Is that or do you guys say Camarillo? I, no, Camarillo. Okay, so he's got a um, um, a sports academy up there, a basketball sports academy, and so it, he he's he's Kobe Bryant, so he's got seven hundred and twenty million in the bank, and so he's not going to sit in L.A. traffic, um, and his you know he can afford it. He's got the means, and so he would charter. Um, uh, aircraft and be, formed a very close relationship with Island Express helicopters, uh, and then there, th- uh, and then specifically the pilot in this accident named Ara or Ara. I don't know how you say. It. How do you think you say that? Uh, I'm gonna say Ara. Okay, we'll Let's call go with we'll, that we'll, then. We'll, we'll call it Ara. And that was his main pilot. And they flew on this badass Sikorsky S76 right. twin engine. Uh, it's a medium helicopter. Uh, can seat you know, like 13 some people, but I think it's outfitted for eight or nine or 10, um, fully IFR capable four axis, um, uh, autopilot system set up, um, and, uh, would utilize this helicopter on a daily basis to fly from, uh, uh, Southern Los Angeles up to Camarillo. Um, but the weather I've heard is all jacked up. I was, I was in Los Angeles. I told you earlier, I was in Lancaster, Uh, a couple months ago. And, um, you know, where I live here in Oklahoma, it's, we have one weather report It comes on the TV and it kind of covers the whole Western part of the state. So it's kind of weird because we're not as populated, obviously. 
um, and our geography is a little bit different. But I, lear I learned three or four months ago when I was in Lancaster that when they do the the weather, there's like four reports. Yeah. There's the valley, there's LA, there's what, what's the other ones? There's at least three or four of them. Uh, 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 well, I, I'll just make a comment that yeah. uh, Lancaster is very much different than the other ones, right? Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you guys are more desert. You're on the other side of the right. uh, on the other side of the mountains. So an, anyway, so the the point is the weather's all crazy there. Um, and so on this day, they had some weather coming in. Um, they fly north, which we're going to go over here in a little bit. But they fly north, and instead of flying over the Santa Monica Mountains or out over the water and and back over, uh, uh, flying back to the east, they have to fly over uh, uh, Glendale and through uh, Burbank airspace, right. around Van Nuys, and then follow um, and then follow the Ventura Freeway through the mountains, which sounds super fun to do something like that, especially in an F seventy six to stay below uh, the mountains. Uh, they the weather closes in, mountain tops are coming, or the uh, cloud tops are coming down. Uh, or the cloud ceilings are coming down. Um, the the pilot gets make, makes a terrible, yeah. multiple terrible decisions. Uh, exhibits poor communication. Doesn't really say what's really on his mind. Uh, says he's going to climb above the 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 the, um, the cloud tops. Uh, gets distracted for one reason or another. Falls into a. a uh, a repetitive, which uh, if those who have watched this channel just over and over again, a spatially disoriented, never-ending, descending left-hand turn uh, right. and flies it straight into the side of one of the Santa, Santa Monica Mountain uh, hilltops. Uh, kills everybody on board. And um, when I made the, the episode, that's not really my expertise necessarily it, it being private charter flights like that. Um, my research and my background is in paramedic stuff and in right. human factors. And so, but so many people, um, had asked me to do this story. So I picked up the story. I, I went through it. I researched it for three or four months. Um, and, and I told the story, but at the, at the end of it, at least at the end of my story, I find a problem with the controllers You did, and the communication between them didn't seem right to me. It didn't seem like it was following the book, the textbook from our, or the, the communication from Aura to the controllers didn't seem right. And so, uh, I kind of dug in, in the video to, um, um, in, into the controllers and, and, yeah. and, and I hit them pretty hard and said, you know, they, they, they didn't follow their checklist. They right. blew off Aura. Um, and I think that that played a role. Um, and that's kind of where where I ended, right? And then so sometime after that, uh, you and I hooked up, and uh, you educated me heavily on uh, some stuff that I was missing, and that's why you're here. So what am I missing? Right. Yeah. So, Didn't you also make a comment that the the second controller or the last controller to talk to Era was a little bit brusque? Right. So, so there, there was two controllers. So right, right after they come from, after they get handed off yeah. from Van Nuys right. terminal, mm -hmm. they get, or tower, they get, they, um, Ara starts talking to SoCal right. or SCT or Tracon kind of all, yeah. all means, all means the same thing. Right? Sure does. Um, and the first controller he was talking to, he had a conversation with him, told him who he was and, um, you know, whatever. And then for one reason or another, that guy either had to clock out or go on break. I'm not sure what it was. It doesn't really say, but a new controller had to come in, which happens, right? It happens 50 times a day. Sure. Takes over his terminal, takes over his seat. Uh, doesn't really realize that Kobe's helicopter is, is even there. It's not. Yeah. Uh, because these guys at SoCal, their, their primary thing seems to be approach and departure with Van Nuys and Burbank, is is that right, or do they do a lot more than you know, that? You know, I can't speak specifically about w those controllers, what their jobs are, really, right. because I'm not an SCT controller. Mm -hmm. But I, I know what the regulations say about how they should have been handling the accident aircraft, and that's what we're here to talk about. Sure, so sure. My my comments to you when we first got together was, um, first of all, I, I may have something else that I'd like to contribute to that video. And I thought it was very well done. I, you know, um, so if you haven't seen the video, I do encourage your listeners to go and look mm -hmm. at that. And, and so, but there was a couple of things that where you 
got on the controllers, and I thought unrightfully so, mm -hmm. because of the fact that the first SET controller had terminated radar on 7-2 Echo X-ray, and therefore that wouldn't, there would have not been a transfer to the new controller about that aircraft because and so he's, the need he's for the checklist gone. wouldn't have been there yeah whether the checklist uh was it wasn't it wasn't had and really it was non sequitur to mm. the accident right the checklist should have been used there's no question procedure wise that should have been used but mm. that was not uh germane to anything that happened to that aircraft okay but there was something that is germane that I don't know how it's got missed, but I'm very in what I talked to you about. So if we, you want to get into that? Oh, now? absolutely. Yeah. Now's the time. So the, the, the issue for me is it's just an unresolved issue and there's a left a lot of unanswered questions. But if the second SCT controller would have known about 72 Echo X ray, would that have delivered a different outcome? I don't know. That's speculation on my part. But here's, here's the facts that I do know. I have a controller that made a statement that he is not going to have 72 Echo X ray on, he said, radar and comms in, in the mm -hmm. transcript, right? So he has this belief that he's not going to be able to surveil the aircraft or to talk to him, right? That and he's going to lose him on radar. Yeah. Well, and, and comms. Right, right. And, and radar is one of those terms that we want to be very careful that we, we want to be specific because we're talking about surveillance now, and I'll explain that as we go along. Because his history had told him, his seven years of experience, I don't work airplanes that are that low going through this area. I don't, I don't surveil them. I don't talk to them. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, I can't provide a service, which was accurate, right? Which Aru was flying low right. abnormally for, for him because of the ceiling tops coming that, down. That's right. And that's why he asked him, hey, you gonna stay, are you going to stay low through the – because mm -hmm. when he gets into the Santa Monica Mountains in be, you know, where the 101 is cut through – He's right. going, he is going to not be able to provide service. So it was right for the controller to say, based upon history, I'm not going to be able to surveil you or I'm not going to be able to have you in radar contact and comms. Therefore, Squawk 1200, which is a code that we assign to VFR aircraft that are not receiving services by ATC, and then to contact Kimaria Tower when he gets a little closer. Perfectly acceptable. And... But that is where the investigation with the NTSB stopped because what is was not talked about is the fact that he didn't lose surveillance. He never lost surveillance. The system, the data shows clearly that there was never surveillance lost on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. So if I have a controller who has a belief that I'm not going to be able to surveil the airplane. Now, we can talk about communications separately, and I do want to talk about communications because that is essential to providing flight following to this type of aircraft. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's the big thing we're talking about is I've got data that says I've got surveillance and I've got a controller who makes a statement on the radio that and, and terminates service. He's not, he said, I can't provide service. And thus does not do so when mm. the data indicates he'd had surveillance. So if he did have surveillance on the aircraft, how come he didn't know about it? How come that wasn't brought up by the in NTSB or the parties to that investigation? And it, it, because it was there was in, as far as the transcript that I read, I don't see anything as far as questioning the controller. Or, sure. or any questions about you know, this unresolved issue. You, you, you didn't provide service to this guy based upon this belief, but your belief was incorrect in this, in this case. Why? Why mm -hmm. is that, that so? And so how does a, a, a somebody at SoCal, one of these controllers, well, they're looking at their screen – I'm, I'm picturing they're, okay. they're in a dark room. They're looking at their screen. It's a big circle or something like that. Okay. And, and there are um, contacts moving around on the screen, mm -hmm. and they know who they are, and right. they're, they're tracking them. How, right. do, how does a controller 
get that information? How is that information getting from the airplane or from somewhere in the world onto that dude's screen? Sure. And it's a good question. And so there's um, a thing called a transponder and interrogator. And what that does is assigns uh, the, the system assigns a four digit code to the aircraft to squawk. That's a term that we use in air traffic control, to squawk. And so the interrogator looks for the transponder aboard the aircraft and then th therefore provides surveillance. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's one of the two ways that we're able to provide what they call cooperative surveillance. Now that's important because we're going to talk about uncooperative at some point, uncooperative uh, or uh, non-cooperative is a correct term, mm. uh, surveillance, which is primary radar. Primary radar is direct reflectivity. That's not what was producing that target. But to answer your question, once we observe that code, then we can start a data tag. A data tag is going to be the aircraft's call sign, any flight mm -hmm. plan information about destination airport, route of flight, that get, that that would go into the system. Right. Therefore, well, well let, let's go back. Let's go back to radar first. So historically, radar has been around for a hundred years, right? And this is um, it's on ships, it's at airports, it's right. it's, mm -hmm. it's on you know some, some aircraft have their own radar. Sure. Uh, you know, um, what is it, for the for the general public out there? How does a radar contact show up on a controller screen if it's being used by radar? Okay. Uh, um, that, it's going to show up differently on depending on what system that you're talking about. Because mm -hmm. if we're talking about a center system, the air route traffic control center is going to show up differently than on a star system. Now, I'm not a stars controller, uh, but um, so I, I can't speak to how it shows up on his display, mm -hmm. right? Well, what I mean is, is you have a, something out in the wild or at an airport that is spinning around. That's right. And it's doing what? What, what, are, what is that thing doing that's spinning around? Uh, well, it's doing two things. So it may take a while to talk about. So let's talk about radar. Well, the, well, the 30 second version. Okay. Radar. Radar is radio detection and ranging. It works off of direct reflectivity. So really what we're talking about is a very simple principle, RF energy out, it hits something, it reflects off of something, and that RF energy is reflected back to an antenna where we can determine its position and in distance from the radar site. Right. So when we have so so basic radar, and again, ba basic basic terms. Sure. We we have a a, a, um, a dish of some sort that is spinning, or it could be looking like something else, but it's spinning. It's sending out a radio signal. It hits something. It comes back, and there's there's some way of interpreting that and generating a digital signal up on a screen that says there's something. That's right. Now still using radar and building a transponder in, how does an a, a, a tra air traffic controller know who that dot is Okay, using that, a squat code? Okay, well, that, that so if we're using a squat code, now we're talking about secondary or beacon radar. So we're talking about two different things. Okay, okay so let's go back to radar, which is, by the way, historically, when radar first came out, because you said, you know, 100 years is not quite that long, but it's right there, all right? But when radar first came out, it was not called primary radar. Why? Because secondary radar wasn't in existence. It came when we got beacon radar, it called it secondary radar and then called radar primary radar. That's how it got its mm. term. So primary radar, if you say the word primary, that could have more than one meaning, right? So primary in this case means the first, okay. right? Right, and so secondary radar means the second, but that has nothing to do with the integrity of the radar because beacon radar is gonna have a higher integrity. Why? So let's talk about beacon radar. Beacon radar, the interrogator sends out a pulse on a bandwidth that the transponder replies to. So it's not reflected energy. Don't forget, reflected energy goes out at one strength and come back at another strength, okay. right? It's never going to be the same, and it's never going to be as strong. Depends on the distance, the reflective capability of the aircraft that's involved. That's why we build stealth aircraft, sure. right? So sure. to avoid that. So, so secondary radar is going to be a higher integrity radar, and that was what the controllers were using for a target in, at the time with 7-2 Echo X-ray, and then... Finally, when he came back up on frequency, 
the the controller ask them to ident, which is a feature of the transponder, uh, which sends a, a different kind of pulse to the interrogator. It's displayed on right. the controllers displayed differently. Okay, that, so so uh, that makes sense. So with 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 beacon radar, the this uh, uh, and again, forgive my ignorance, but I'm use terms that my wife would use the thing that spins around the, is sending out a signal it's but right. it's a, but it's a higher strength signal um and it is interpreted one way and the aircraft sent the transponder for the aircraft sends back a signal and because the radar controller or somebody told the pilot a number right some number right and That's i know good. some numbers mean some things but let's just say some random number it's and it's seven seven two zero he says, I want you to squawk 7720 to the pilot of this Southwest Airlines flight. Okay. The pilot then has to literally look down at his transponder or her transponder and type in 7720. Adjust the dial. Right? right? Mm -hmm. or, or adjust the dials. And then that way, the radar controller knows they put the two things together. The computer probably does it, but they put the two things together and they say, that blip it's coming back as 7729, so now I know that that is this airline or this aircraft or whatever. Yeah, not Correct. nine, though. We only go, we only go up to seven. Zero oh. to seven. But anyway, oh, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. So, so um, and, and that's, that process is very um, routine, and we've been using that for a lot of years. Many decades, right? right? Uh, and and that not, that's not unique to the United States. That's, this is international type type stuff. It could be a little different in different places, but beacon radar is sending out a signal, transponders coming back, radar controller interprets that and can see not only that there is an aircraft, but who that aircraft is based on that system. That's right. Right? So when I'm sitting at my house and I go outside with Lennon uh, all, all the time and we sit in the, we sit in the driveway and we see these aircraft go over, and I have this app on my phone called uh, Flight Radar, and I can I can point it up, and it and it it knows who that aircraft is on, on my phone, right? Or I can just sit there and look at it, and there's thousands of aircraft all around right. the world, and I can zoom in, and I can I can p poke the aircraft with my finger and say, oh, that's Southwest Airlines, you know, twenty four twenty. And here's their speed and their altitude and their heading. I mean, it doesn't give me much, but it, it, and it's giving me ground speed, I think, is what it's giving me. It's not giving me their actual speed, but it gives you a couple things, right? And you can sit there and watch where they started and where they're planning to go. Um, and anybody can do this. Is that using beacon radar or is that using something else? It's using something else. And how does that work? How does, how does, how can I see that? If there's not radar shooting at all those aircraft, what 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 what's the technology that's that's there? It's called ADSB. ADSB, and so that's the same website that we're going to look at in a minute that we're going to track some stuff. But th that's actually the name of the technology. What does that stand for? Automatic Dependent Surveillance Broadcast. Okay, so if you're explaining how that works. To Lennon back there, who's in who's in high school, how would you do it? How would you explain what ADSB is? Well, it's most commonly referred to as the satellite-based surveillance system, but that is not entirely true. Yeah. Um, but that is a component of it. Lennon, so, you can pull up the AD, ADSB exchange site. Okay, and and so a, as an example, before you get into the the, the nitty gritty of it, okay. this is ADSB exchange, which is is, is it's just a different website that's kind of like flight radar. Um, and you can, I see a lot of stuff on here. And so Lennon, click, on, click on the pink one. <laughs> just, 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 just click on one. Just click on that. So when we up. click on, on, on this plane, uh, now zo zoom in on that, that, uh, that track. So uh, zoom back out so we can see the whole track. So this plane's coming out of Denver like all planes do. <laughs> and what do we got over there? We've got a, a tail number. We've got its squawk its squawk code is 2000. It's a United Airlines 777-200. And where's it where's it go? Where's it coming from? Where's it going? It's going from Denver and where's it where's it going? You might have to zoom out to see where it's going, let it. By the way, that 2 
zero 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 would not be a a, a code that you would normally see in in the conterminous of the United States. It's, it's an oceanic code. Oh, so okay. They squat two thousand when they go over the ocean. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, but we can see there that this thing is at thirty seven thousand feet it's on a on a heading of 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 almost two hundred twenty five degrees. Uh, it's flying at 460 knots ground speed. Um, I mean, that's a lot of info. Yeah. And this, all this stuff that's on here, I can see this pretty much all, all around the world. But you're, all the stuff that we're looking at, that's not radar. That's not radar. How does that stuff get up there on your screen? That's what I want to know. All right. So there's a system of satellites that ADSB uses and so for the very first time, the inertial or the GPS of the aircraft using the GPS satellites that are flying around determine its position. So the aircraft determines its position. That's fundamentally different from radar. That's the opposite. Yes. It, it, we Almost. tell them where they are, right? We're using radar and then beacon radar. But using... ADSB, the aircraft determines its position and then broadcasts that. That's why you're able to get a site like this. It's just broadcast to anybody that's got a receiver, right? Right. And so um, we have the aircraft can actually now broadcast that to each other so they can actually have better situational awareness. That's what that's what one of the main benefits of it is because you can have ADSB. This is, by the way, this is called ADSB out. Okay. So the aircraft is transmitting its position along with, and if you were to scroll down on the left you, or just drag that bar down, there's a whole bunch of other information uh, that, that are, it is there. Okay. So, I mean, there's even more data. And that goes out. Now, what you do with that, uh, that depends on what your receiver is doing. So um anyway adsb out broadcasts its position now how does it get to air traffic control it's broadcasting this position and then picked up by a number of ground stations mm -hmm. these ground stations are not radar stations they are ground stations that are actually not even owned by the faa uh, there is some sort of contract with uh, l3 harris corporation and the faa that br that brings this data from the ground stations to the air traffic control facilities. So then we're able to see the same kind, of, not, not as uh, uh, robust of data as that, but we see the things that beacon radar would give us, right? We see mm -hmm. velocity, and we hadn't really talked about mode C, but we're talking about the mode C of an aircraft is the aircraft's altitude, right? right. ADSB computes that as well. It does that a little bit differently using a combination of pressure altitude and actual position over a sphere, but it's really kind of co complicated. It's just the aircraft's at altitude. That's the big thing. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. So it, that's how that gets to the controller. Well, you know, if we're going to bring this up. Well, let's, he, well, let, let, yeah, let's look ahead. at this map. When you, would you talk about, um, I think you can just scroll in, Lennon, like with everything else. So just go over like Oklahoma City and where we are right in the middle of the country. And so th this map is telling me what? What are those? What are, those look like oil derricks. They, they are indeed not oil derricks. They are ground stations. And actually, we could actually see one, you know, the actual antenna if we want to do something. But for right now... We can just take a look at these, and this is all the ground stations that are receiving GPS position information from aircraft. Don't forget, the aircraft are transmitting their position and altitude to whoever receives it. Right. For air traffic control purposes, we get our positions from the aircraft from these ground stations, which are fed into air traffic control. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And where does these ground stations get their information from? From a satellite? Yes. Uh, from, well, from, from the aircraft, because the aircraft communicates with the GPS. It transmits its signal, okay? And I'll make more, more just to be cover all the technical bases. So GPS is not really accurate enough to compute its position in the way we need to use it for air traffic control. So there's a set of another satellites, which is called WAS. I don't know if you want to go there, but Wide Area Augmentation 
uh, system. And this ends up sending a rebroadcast and recalculates the aircraft position because these air these these receivers are on a set. They're on the air traffic control facility themselves, so mm -hmm. th we can survey them, right? And they don't move. Sure. So therefore, we can get transmit the the, the airplane transmits more accurate information. So that's a I brief see. scenario about. So so Lennon, flip flip back and forth between the two screens real quick, like between this one and the ADSB, just flip back and forth. So these aircraft right here, they're flying along, and go, go back to the aircraft. And we're, we're all these aircraft have a transponder uh, box in in the aircraft, and they type in a code of, of a four digit code, and the aircraft is receiving information from a satellite that's helping to give them a coordinate of where they are, and then that transponder is sending a signal to one of those other receivers that we're seeing. Kind of. Uh, let me in 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 very basic terms, right. So the and none of that is radar. None of it is there radar. is there is no flying underneath that unless you're five feet off the ground. Uh, so the ground stations have coverage looks like radars, but it's going to be much greater than radars because one the you see the sheer volume, right? Right, right. And um, uh, there's not that many radars in the system. Um, you know, there's a tenth of, of what you saw I, there. I see. So, but. The, to get back to your question about the transponder, so the mode S of the transponder is kind of the conveyor belt for information. So it's, this is not widely known, but it, you have a transponder and then you have the ADSB out equipment. So the ADSB out equipment is, is communicating with the satellites and then feeding that information to the transponder mode S, and that is what is the conveyor belt of information that is sent to the to ground those, station. To those ground stations, ground stations that we were that, just looking at. That's right. At. So what that what that means is you can have an ADSB failure and still have a transponder and in, an in interrogator surveillance system, right? Right. But that's now you're working on the transponder and interrogator surveillance system, not the ADSB. If you have a transponder failure, you have no transponder or ADSB. You you've lost all that, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's the critical difference. And now you're back to that direct reflectivity, that primary radar is right. the only surveillance source. Okay, letting go. Uh, scroll out on this page, and let's go over to LA. So back to radar just for a second. Sure. If a controller at SoCal is using radar, which we'll talk about in a second, but it is using radar. Where is that spinny thing? Where, where would one be? One at the airport? Um, are they in different locations? Where are those located? Yeah, it depends on the sector and what they have piped in for that sector. I don't know where this sector's radars are. Would it be in Southern California somewhere? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, because, yeah, it's got to have a, a distance. So okay. a terminal radar is going to be usually optimized to 60, 80 miles, and that's I it. I see. So somewhere in this picture, there are probably multiple ra radar there, points. There, there are spinny things. Spinny right? things, yeah. But in spinny. this case, what we're looking at is these are ADSB receivers, That's and right. I see two of them. I see one there in the Angeles National Forest, and one in the top of the Santa Monica Mountains, um, just south of Calabasas. That's right. Okay, and so. Just to make sure we're on the same page. Again, okay. like I'm a kindergartner. Radar is spinning around. It's sending out a signal, and it has to see something. It actually has to hit something and then also get it back. So it's like times two. It's got to hit it, and it's got to come back. And then it's got to be able to interpret that that's a contact, right, and not a right. bird or a stealth aircraft. Or We have ways of filtering that out, but yes. Right. And and then this is what we've most of us have when you know, I watch movies and and, and all right. that. This is what we're yeah. used to seeing. It a blip a blip on a, the radar. A blip on the right? radar. And so um, that that's historically what we've always had. What you're telling me about from from flight radar and ADSB exchange website is ADS is a, is a technology called ADSB, which instead of something having to hit the aircraft and send it out, the aircraft is figuring out where it is on its own. And just sending the signal out to these stations, and it's far more 
uh, less prone to what? Less prone to uh, interference by mountains, less prone to interference by by what? Why do we have ADSP? What's what's its purpose? You know, why um, why is it here when radar's been around forever? Yeah, well, radar is expensive to maintain. Okay. That's that's the number one thing. And going into the next gen of air traffic control, uh, we, we want a, a reliable surveillance system that is easy to maintain and very reliable. So we have procedures that are being developed all over this country that rely heavily on ADSB and the ability for the aircraft to navigate what is called RNP1, required navigation performance. Without this WAS and this system of satellites, they're not able to navigate that accurately, mm. okay? But, um, and, and it should be noted, when you talked about radar, and you did so correctly by talking about re direct reflectivity, the interrogator antenna that shoots out this pulse asking for a return, that's the code that the aircraft squawks, mm -hmm is located on that same radar antenna. It's usually mounted above. It can be mounted below, but it's usually an antenna that's above that radar, that spinny thing that you right, talked about. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. So, so it, okay. So let's, so I, th I think we've got a fundamental understanding of like, when I say fundamental, I mean fundamental, third grade. We're up to about third grade between, or at least I do. Uh, I know that you do uh, uh, of the difference. So we're gonna. What I want to do is I want to look at the video and I want to pull up ADSB Exchange and we're gonna we're gonna sh look at the flight and then you can tell me what it is, kind of that we're looking at. Sure. Okay? Can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead. So ADSB is not new technology. It's been around for a long, long time. And as a matter of fact, the foreign if you fly to a, you know to Europe or South America those uh, the ADSB is going to be the primary surveillance source for those controllers and so um eight, just a little historical content because i think it's a really important that we 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 dig this up is is the mandate for aviators to have ADSB out was may it was was written in stone on may of 2010 and the day in which you had to equip your aircraft, and I hope we'll show the the chart that shows which airspace you have to fly, if you fly in, that you have to have ADSB, was January 2nd of 2020. So the FAA gave the aviators and airlines and whoever whoever's flying 10 years to equip their aircraft for this mandate to go into effect on January 2nd, 2020. So I first heard of ADSB as a safety rep back in 2008, 2009, something like that. But I followed ADSB all along, all that whole time, trying to understand how it works, trying to get all the uh, I'm, I'm the type of guy that if I can get my hands on it, if I tear it apart and put it back together, then I have a better understanding of how it works. So I, I was been following ADSB for a very, very long time. And when it came close to the implementation date, there, there were many questions that I had, and we'll talk about that later. But um, I just wanted to give that historical content to your viewers because you know ADSB is not something that just you know popped out of nowhere and we've got it now right. here in 2020. So AD, so ADSB has been around for a long time and so much so the federal government does a study on everything before they put something into place and so at some point they must have done some studies and research whatever but in 2010 they published something that said 10 years from now right this technology is so useful. It's so good for efficiency and safety and, and on and on and on and, and cost savings, lots of different reasons, I'm sure. But we're going to give you 10 years. And on this date that you said, January 2nd, 2020, you have your aircraft, if you're going to be flying through this airspace, has to be able to have it. That's right. Right? And so... That's 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 what we're looking at here. So this is January. So so the day after, and so this is coming from the FAA. Is this make sense? Is this what you're looking at? Uh, Must be equipped with ADSB out avionics by January of 2020. 
Yeah, that says January one. Actually, but you know, it's it, we're close enough, right? Yeah. And so the um, what day was the Kobe crash? It was January twenty sixth, two thousand twenty. So about January. three and a half weeks after this. Yeah. So, and we're going to circle back to this, so we don't need to go okay. too far into depth. But if this was a requirement for aircraft, it doesn't matter if we're talking Delta Airlines mm -hmm. or. A, a part 91 charter flight or an EMS helicopter flying part 135. It doesn't matter if you're flying through um, certain airspace on January, uh, January 2nd of 2020, you have to have the ADSB out portion of your transponder functioning on the, on the receiving end of that is what was the requirement for controllers to see that? Uh, that is uh, a good question. Um, I can show you what I think the controllers received as training, and it's mostly um, from FARs and changes to our air traffic control procedures, which is 7110.65. And it was mostly um, administrative. There was no training that I can see that was given on the improvements that you'll be getting for surveillance or what ADSB, how it works. Um, certainly, if we're going to look at a graph that shows the airspace, we'll know that the United States is the only country that has two ADSB systems, and I can explain why that is. Mm -hmm. And we'll talk about ne what November 72 Echo X-ray had um, at least what, what I think he had in his aircraft as one of the systems, right? But 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 the point is, is that there wasn't any um, like heads up or training or knowledge that, hey, we're going to have a big, a, probably a pretty big improvement to your surveillance controllers for these aircraft that are broadcasting. Now, it doesn't affect for those aircraft that are not broadcasting. If they're okay. flying in airspace that doesn't require the ADSB, that's fine. Well, let well well let's take let's take a look. Okay, okay. So we've got this memo up here. Names are redacted. This is two weeks before the deadline you're talking about of January second. Five weeks before the Kobe crash. In general terms, what is this memo saying? This is from the FAA, and it's to all areas of TMU and OMIC. What does that mean? Yeah. Who's getting this memo? So all, all the controllers, including traffic management units, uh, unit and the o omics are operational managers. Okay. So, um, and, and basically all this is administrative stuff, uh, things that are going to change. It doesn't change how I interact with the display. It, it talks about things that I have to say that are going to be a little bit different and incorporates the new surveillance system. And it doesn't do so completely as I can show you the new surveillance system it, meaning ADSB. ADSB but it talks about things that you have to say if you observe a failure um, and, and and so on and so forth it's but it, it doesn't talk about hey be looking for your new d uh, improved surveillance system right. it just talks about we've got this thing and be ready for it on on January 2nd so I want to read what it says right here. It says that this memo is to inform operational personnel, blah, 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 um, and some other stuff, which in the purpose of this memo is to outline changes to the aforementioned national orders for ADSB that will become effective on January 2nd, 2020. So this memo is just one of probably a million pieces of documentation that is, that is showing that that the FAA is recognizing and you're trying to send a message out to people of how to get prepared for this new technology or not new technology, but for this technology that is going to be required that's been around for 10 years or, or more on January 2nd. So this is, this is not a secret or anything like this. They're, they're trying no. to prep people. Hey, this is coming on January 2nd as a requirement. Here's some stuff that's going to pop up. If, if some problems that might happen, here's how to be prepared for it. That's what this is. Uh, yes, uh, I'll take note that a verbal briefing by the OS required. So even though the date is December 16th, uh, for this facility anyway, uh, it came out sometime after that. So you're, it's not 
the the time is not even uh, sure not even accurate but I, I, again it this talks about a more housekeeping or administrative secretarial um, uh, administrative work it doesn't talk about substantively how it's going to change you the way you do air traffic control if you scroll down I, I I can show you because it talks about like ATC surveillance source and and if you scroll down, even a little bit further, right? It says primary radar unavailable, radar services available on transponder or ADSB. So the changes, the change that occurred, the big change is they simply added ADSB equipped aircraft only. Is that any big deal? Is that of any consequence? No, well, it's not. Mm. Uh, they just added ADSB as a surveillance source. So, right. so right. It's in, in what I've got to say. And so again, that's, that's really not any big deal. Uh, it, it should be noted that the FARs were published for review, the federal air regulations on the use of ADSB and where it's going to be required, was published uh, some three years prior to implementation for people to comment, review, uh, which AOPA- um, Open uh, comment period yes, stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, on January 2nd, they were, you know, law, you know, so- Right, so, right. Um, if you'll again scroll down a little bit more, I'll show you another example of just simple inter see ADSB out turned off. That that that's just an inclusion. If we just put ADSB in something that was already written, so right? so across the country, all the, the the SoCal controllers along with all of the other controllers were they aware that ADSB was going to be required in these particular airspaces come January second. I can't say for the entire country, but I can speak for many controllers that I talked to. First of all, they didn't know how ADSB worked, and they may have had a briefing that was administrative like this one, but it was inconsequential to way, the way they perform their duties day in and day out. Mm -hmm. They didn't know that, hey, I'm going to have an, a better surveillance system with these aircraft that are squawking. Uh, Would they, they have received squitting, tra actually. training for this? So, so they're used to looking at their radar screen, right? Whatever it's called, their radar screen, sure, and screen knowing screen. that the information that's coming to them is from the radar spinny things. Right. That, the, the, and if they've worked there twenty years, for twenty years, the stuff I see on my screen is coming from a radar, a be beacon radar uh, um, signal of of some sort. That's right. And now. Um, on January second of two thousand twenty, there's going to be a, a, a another way for the for, to to be able to surveil these aircraft. Um, how do they? How do the controllers across the country learn about that and and build that into their knowledge base and their everyday um, operations? I don't know the answer to that question. I can tell you in my particular career field. I mean, I've done a a presentation that is about an hour and a half long that we can tell controllers and form controllers about how ADSB works. But there's no, I, I don't know what the country received. I can't, mm -hmm. I can't go to every facility, but just based upon corporate knowledge, I think that very little was done to educate the controllers on the, uh, the effectiveness of this. And, and the other thing is, is that where is this target coming from? That was, was is it, it coming from radar? radar? Is it coming from ADSB? Yeah, that's right. We don't. There was uh, in, in, all they know after January second. So when Jan at January third comes along, when they're when a radar or when I'm sorry, when a controller is looking at the, at their screen, they don't know, and they, they probably don't need to know, but they don't know if that's coming from radar or ADSB. That's essentially right. correct. That's right. a, especially in the en route environment. Now, right. uh, in the stars environment, which SC Southern California Tracon had, they have a a different kind of target that will tell them whether that's coming from ADSB or not. I don't know if that was part of their training uh, that they got, but we we can take a look right. at the training records. It was a five minute I see written briefing. So okay, on the left, what do we have on the left? We have the historical data, which which. For all the accidents that I've done, Peter, um, if they've taken place in the last three or four years, it's it's kind of it, it's kind of creepy that we can we can pull this up on the internet and yeah. and just track this. But what we're looking at on the left is exactly what we've been talking about. We're looking at um, uh, uh, tracks and maps of the the last day um, 
of a flight for Kobe Bryant's aircraft that he that he was flying on. And so there's multiple legs that are on here, and we'll zoom in and and look at the right ones. Um, but let's go to the day before the crash. Uh, so just hit previous there, zoom out. And so Island Express Helicopters was known for taking taking people out to. Um, is that Catalina Island? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and and doing tours out there. And it, it, man, if you go to their website, it looks super cool flying flying around there. And so they had flown from from Catalina Island into John Wayne Airport um, to pick up Kobe Bryant, and they took him out there to uh, Camarillo in the northwest. And it looks to me uh, like they flew straight over downtown and straight over the Santa Monica Mountains. Lennon, go ahead and, well, actually, where they're sitting right there, it shows that they're at 2,300 feet. Go to go to the track just above it, though, where they were going towards Calabasas, but right over the mountain, right over the green. Yeah, right about there. And so they're at about 2,300 feet, and so those that they're that's 100 feet over those mountaintops because I think they're 2,200, I think, is, is, is the peak. And so the weather was clear this day. Right. And this aircraft can fly five times higher than that, no problem at all, right? Um, and so they just flew straight over the mountains, uh, landed in Camarillo, did their thing, and then flew back. But on the accident day, so go to the accident day, Lennon, things are are a lot different. And again, if you want the full specifics, folks, of, um, uh, uh, of the communication and why they took this flight this way, uh, like I said, look, look, at, look at the original video. But we're going to go down here to... Um, we're going to zoom in on on John Wayne Airport and just just click them coming out of the airport, Lennon, and throw that on 10, 10 times speed and then zoom out a little bit. Okay, so now we're sitting here and we're watching this aircraft and it's going at 10 times, but it's telling me, me, the, the, the guy at home in real time. That's and right. I know we're replaying this, but the guy at home watching this, who's just sitting there watching this all day long, uh, it, he can he could have clicked on this tail number, and he can tell right now as they're as they're coming into Norwalk that 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 this aircraft is flying at 155 knots on a on a heading of 321, 400 foot off the ground. That's right. Without any radar, mm -hmm. this is using the ADSB technology that you've been talking about. That's correct. And the date of this is January 26. And as they get up by the airports, those airspaces is required that they have this, right? That's right. And when Which, you're going to Burbank and Van Nuys, yes. And right. And so if they're Charlie. flying out in the sticks like they do here in Oklahoma, flying all around, it, it's right. not necessary. But when they're going into these congested airspaces, you have to have ADSB out. That's correct. Okay. And, and I can see that. You can see that. And Lennon back there can see <laughs> that. Okay. So go ahead and zoom in on Glendale there, Lennon, and then put that in the middle. Now, now we're uh, on the right is just from my video, and I'm, we're just going to go through some of the radio traffic that they have. So go ahead and play that radio traffic on the left, Lennon, or on the right. Actually, Burbank, Tower, Burbank, Kill, Timber, three zero one nine, Burbank, Clash, Charlie, surface area is IFR, stay in tension. Uh, keep it going. Keep it going. Now on the one one west now two. November two Echo X-ray hold outside Burbank, Clash, Charlie airspace. I have an aircraft going around. Okay, so right now they're circ they're circling around Glendale, in making right hand turns, left hand turns, and they're only flying at seventy knots, seven eight hundred foot off the ground, and they're going between this mountain pass. This Glendale's kind of down in a valley for those of you that aren't from LA, and right on the other side of this pass is Burbank Airport. So you can't just fly through there. You got to get. The tower, you got to get a, a tower to give you that's right. A, 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 um, um, uh, the permission to fly through. Correct. Uh, and so that's why we see Bur Burbank Tower there. Oh, there's my ugly face. That's why we see Burbank Tower there. And he's saying that he's got another aircraft that just tried to land. They, something happened. They're doing a go around. He's telling our to wait and hold and and circle over Glendale. Now, I don't think that I hit this enough just from a human factor standpoint, and I know that's not why you're here, uh, but I didn't I didn't hit it enough in the original video, but it was at this point, the Swiss cheese model, everybody knows the Swiss right. cheese model, they've already gone through 17 holes at this point hmm. it, from a human factor standpoint of weather checks, of, of problems with the weather, of, um, of weather changing, uh, all kinds of things. And at this point, 
this would have been the point where uh, most a lot of the pilots that I've spoken to said this is where he should have turned around and said I I've already got uh, weather problems. It's only going to get worse as we go into this valley up here and start flying through the mountains. And now this aircraft just had a go around uh, right in front of me. I'm circling. Let me just turn turn and go back. Uh, and so I just want to point that out. I didn't hit that enough in the first one, but um, it, 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 it's a, it's upsetting to think to listen to him talk about. Well, I'm going to sit here and circle for nearly 30 minutes. They're they're just they're just flying around in circles. So um, so Lennon, jump jump ahead. Go and so with you for the special via fire transition. We are currently at 1400. Helicopter 7 to Echo X-ray Van Nuys Tower. Wind calm, visibility 2 and 1 half. Ceiling 1,100 overcast. Van Nuys altimeter 3016. Okay, and so now he is flying up. What, what is that highway there that's going northwest? Right right through Burbank. What's that highway called? Um, is that the 118? No. It is, no. It is the 118 yes. going northwest. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so he's ta- he's t- yeah because he said he was taking the 118 or following the uh, the 118. And so now he's been transitioned over to Van Nuys Tower, mm-hmm. right? And um, we're still not at SoCal. And, he, and no matter who you are, if you're flying, this is very important, uh, I, I believe, to this story, no matter who you are, you have to call that tower if you're flying through here. Oh, yes. It's not optional. No, no. no. <laughs> right? And so even though this is a, a VFR flight, there's no instrument flight plan, plan filed or anything like that, he s- still has to con- contact them to get permission to fly through their airspace, That's correct? correct, yes. And so um, the the he is, is now s- saying that he has a special VFR clearance. What does that mean? Well, it's special VFR is less than standard VFR weather minimums, right? I don't know if we need to go into every detail of it, but it, yeah, it just, yeah, it, most of that's in the in the original video. I think someone hammered me because I accidentally said modified VFR instead of marginal VFR somewhere. So yeah, it's a, but whatever. but the point is is that you normally don't take off in that and do it on purpose. But if things start to get a little worse, you can get some extra clearance. Just kind of to get you to where you're going, if 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 you've dropped just a tad b- below right. minimums, that it's kind of thing. It's very popular with helicopter flying because they can right. fly special VFR because they're slower and they can right and they're more maneuverable. They can yes. they can stop and turn around a, a, a lot easier. That's okay. Right. Okay. Go, and so what they're doing right now is Van Nuys has told them, uh, I want you to fly north around the airport instead of flying right over us. Fly right. fly north around us. Um, and so go go ahead and play this next one. Um, Clear Van Nuys Delta. Did you want to talk to SoCal? Hey, from up to a question. Okay, pause it. Now, play that again, dude. I have to. I have to play it again. That, that same exact one, Lennon. Want to start? Yep, just that 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 one that you just played. Again, my my world of of human factors, and so when I read this, when I hear this, th- to me, this is one of the top two or three heartbreaking moments of this entire flight. And you correct me if I'm wrong, but this is just just my interpretation of it. He, you just said you have to talk to the towers. That's not an option. Helicopter, EMS, police—I don't care who you are. If you're flying through that that airport airspace, you have to talk to the tower that's there. But what she's saying is she's clearing him uh, for a pathway to fly to Camarillo, and his next tower's 25 minutes away. Yeah, right. And he's not going to talk to them for another 20 or 25 minutes till he gets through Calabasas and on the other side uh, of that valley. But she says, do you want to talk to SoCal? SoCal is not a tower. No. Those are con- are controllers. That is air traffic control, right? Well, so are the tower controllers. Well, that be, but. well yeah, but but I mean, they, they, they are- Surveillance um, controllers. Uh, uh, su- 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 surveillance controllers. And for a VFR flight flying- at 1,100 feet off the ground, there is zero requirement for Aura to talk to SoCal. That's correct. Correct? And in in my experience on an EMS helicopter, and this is Part 91 stuff, but we, you know, medical helicopters do Part 91 when we don't have a patient on board. <clears throat> um, I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> my series always jumping in. And so uh, the, the only reason that I can think of that he answers in the affirmative on this is he wants some assistance. He wants somebody to um, per, uh, confirm the things that he's thinking about how things are looking up there, maybe weather problems, maybe just some flight following and 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 
and and get, and giving him some guidance of some of some sort. He's not very clear on it, Aura, right. and, and that's his fault. But I do think that from this point moving forward, it is imperative for for anybody who's investigating this to take into account that he wa- that Aura wanted to talk to SoCal, even though he didn't have to. And I think it's because he was anticipating needing their assistance. That's just my opinion. Um, so that I, I, I digress. So Lennon, uh, go ahead and play that one more time and then we'll skip to the next one. Clear Van Ice Delta, did you want to talk to SoCal? Hey, from it up to a question. Good, then go ahead, go, just go ahead and skip to the next one. And so at this point, so, so Van Nuys has now transferred them to SoCal. They're, they're flying, just about to fly over Woodland Hills into Calabasas and about to start following the Ventura Freeway uh, west. And here's where they make, uh, R makes his first contact with SoCal. Go ahead, Lennon. SoCal helicopter, it's a two-way question. We do it for visiting a VFR condition at 1,500 to Camarillo. Helicopter Stone 2, Echo X-ray, SoCal approach. Roger, and you just going to stay down low at that for all the way to Camarillo? Yes, sir. Low altitude, 2 Echo and to make extra, Roger, uh, I'm going to lose ra- radar and uh, comms with you probably pretty shortly. So you're going to squawk VFR, and uh, when you get closer, go to Camarillo Tower. Copy that. We'll squawk VFR to echo. Okay. And so when you would, I don't know if that gives you chest pain when you listen to that, but it. Yeah, that's. My I thought it, I thought it did before, but after Peter coming into my life, now it makes now it makes my chest pain even even worse. What? What concerns you about that that uh, communication? Well, simply stated, on December 31st of 2019, that statement that I'm going to lose you on radar and comms was probably accurate. But January 26th, it was not accurate, but the controller didn't know it. He wasn't taught that he was going to have additional surveillance and may may have, there was unknown surveillance, unknown communication. We don't know whether we're going to, but what could have happened differently? But the-, the, the Why would it have been a normal, a, a, an appropriate and normal thing to say in December? Because, why, why, would he, why would it be a normal for him to say, I'm going to lose you on radar and comms? Because of the mandate, January 2nd, of 2020 to the aircraft to be having ADSB out. Now the aircraft was already equipped, but we switched our surveillance over so that we were going to now use surveillance from ADSB mm-hmm. as our primary source. I mean, not the first source, the 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 most the one with the most integrity. Right. But I mean in in December if if they were using radar it would have been appropriate to say that because the controller would expect to lose this guy, lose Aura on radar. That's correct. And because mo- he, he's flying so low. Most likely that would have happened. You right. Know? So, and it probably happens all the time. Right. With well, all kinds of going, aircraft. He's working on historical data. I mean, he's been there for seven years. If you're going to stay there low, I'm going to lose you. So it's appropriate. He should not provide service, in right. my opinion. And no. provide service means if he if Aura is about I, to ask for flight following, he's got to say, look, I don't think this is going to work because I'm not going to be able to see you anyway. Right. And I'm not going to, my radio communication is not even going to be able to reach you. You got interference between buildings and, and, and mountains and you're, you're too low to the ground. So in December, that would have made sense. Yes, it, it would have. And that's the and way he now, had handled it. But this is January 26. Right. This aircraft has ADSB because, um, uh, 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 Chester, who's sitting at home in his mom's basement, sitting here watching this stuff all day long, like I do, just he's an absolute nerd, just watching every single airplane. He's watching this. That's right. And he's not losing them. He's got them right now on this public website at 140 knots at 1,200 feet with a heading of 244 degrees at, thi- at this moment. That's right. right. Now. Mm. So, Lennon, go ahead and jump, jump to the next one, dude. And so now here we are. We have we we um, the 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 controller has said we're gonna we're probably gonna lose you on radar. Um, you're too you're probably too low. So why don't you just squawk twelve hundred, which is a VFR code, right? And so we see that on our screen. That means all oh, that guy's a VFR flight. He's not being tracked and, by and, an air traffic and, controller. And he's not he's not being tracked. R- and, but our and our surveillance data from ADSB 
does show that we tracked the aircraft all the way to the accident site. Right. right? So we, we know that. Absolutely. And so at this point right now, he's on the Ventura freeway and he has ju- Ara has just spoken to that controller about 45 seconds ago who said that he was going to lose him in a little bit. But now when he gets to the Ventura freeway, he gets on the radio and there's a different controller. There's somebody different. There's a different voice. And right. Ara doesn't, they don't come on and say, hey, this is different controller, John, right? It's just, it's just a different voice. Right. And I don't know if Ara would have known that. He probably would not have. But we know now, based on the investigation, that a new controller has sat down in the chair and that's who's going to answer the radio the next time. Right. And right? it was several minutes be- between when he said, I'm going to lose you on radar and comms until this happens because right. it was se- several minutes. I'm, 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 I want to say it was four minutes. Is that accurate? Thir- thir- yeah. thirty. We're going from 3312 to here. So it's about two minutes and 12 seconds is, it would be the difference between All right. uh, then. And so in, in the video, in my video that I had, the 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 – the NTSB investigators will come back to the investigation in a minute, but they hit hard on this checklist that ha- this relief checklist that has to happen. Yeah, um, not only for replacing one controller for another, but also if you are terminating flight following. Now you, you you've kind of um, and a couple of people that have, have have shared the same sentiment as you. Um, they didn't really accept the flight following in the first place, so there's really no need to necessarily terminate it because it never happened in, in the first place, um, which is true. But I still believe that Ara felt he was getting the flight follow. Yeah. E- a- even though I believe you that the controllers didn't have the responsibility because they never said, okay, copy that. We were giving you a flight follow. This is a very unusual check-in for an aircraft not receiving services by ATC to check in a- by saying, hey, we're going to go ahead and start our climb. So either he thought he was still, you know, thought he was getting services, but, but he should have realized he's not. Or I have, I've thought about this, and this is a supposition on my part. He wants to make the people in back think that he's got things under control, and if we're going to just talk to SCT, we're going to, because we're going to climb to go above the layers, right? So we've we've got an in, inadvertent encounter with IMC conditions, right? About to, about to happen, about, probably. It, it, he he knows that it's coming. It, it's 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 in, imminent, and so so I, I I don't know why you would, he would, should check in. Normally, he would say SoCal November seven two Echo X Ray with you, like flight flight following, mm-hmm. and you know maybe hit the ident or whatever. But he says, we're going to go ahead and start our climb. And that's what confused the controller at SCT, right? right? Absolutely. And so that's what I jumped on was uh, Ara comes back over and he says, we're going to we're gonna climb. And he says that we're going to stay with you. And so in my mind, no matter how many times I've replayed this and talked about it, this whole time Ara has been thinking that he's have, that somebody's watching him. And and he's he's wrong because his mm-hmm. communication was terrible. He didn't he didn't it, 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 typically if you're going to contact those controllers in these helicopters, you're going to declare some type of emergency, and none of that ever happened. At this point, uh, there's a lot of people online left some really good comments and talked about because uh, I didn't really talk about it uh, enough uh, because the autopilot part of the aircraft is not really my expertise. But this is a four-axis autopilot. That's right, and it's literally one or two buttons to get him going straight. And it's his in his spec to do that, right? Right. That's his that's his escape maneuver, right? right? So he's in his. Uh, SOPs for his uh, uh, for Island Express is to uh, slow down to a certain speed, which he's right. buzzing away. Uh, yeah, uh, to slow down to a, a certain speed, level the aircraft, put it in autopilot, and I think to have a steady climb. That's right. Uh, if I'm not that's, mistaken, that's what I remember. And instead, he says that we're gonna we're just gonna get on top of these clouds because he knows that the cloud tops I think are 2,400 feet. And he says, "Well, I, I can climb over that." And then, but that's against the law, isn't it? it unless he's f- cutting through a hole or something like that. Yeah, uh, that's what the controller said he thought he was doing. But you know, um, d- given the weather conditions, that'd have been uh, far fetched. Um, you know, uh, I, I you know the NTSB. 
I believe, got it right. He was involved in a somatographic illusion and lost control of the aircraft. But 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 the point is somatographic. That's on your vocabulary list, Lennon. <laughs> uh, uh, that that the pilot is either about to or is already encountered IMC, inadvertent mm -hmm. IMC, which now as controllers, we go right to chapter seven, uh, 10 in our 7110.65, and we have a list of things that we're required to do, and uh, none of them involve rotor aircraft. They're all involve fixed wings. So, mm. so uh, you know, we're not really well equipped, but we'll get to a point here. We'll, uh, we'll get to a part where I'll make a point that even in this video that that we haven't talked about one controller to the next, he this controller doesn't know anything about seven two echo X ray, right? He doesn't know who's talking to him. No, no, doesn't know where he is, and and I guess we can go on. But yeah, go go ahead and um uh play play this, Lennon. Helicopter two echo X ray. We're gonna go ahead and start our climb to go above the uh, layers, and uh, we can stay with you. So there's nine seconds that go by, and I put that emphasis in there. Hold on. We'll come. Two Echo X-ray, uh, where are you? Yeah. So I put that nine seconds in there because that nine seconds was probably that controller going, who said that? Right. Yeah. And he's looking on his screen for a, a 12, somebody 1,200 who's in that area, and... What? Yeah. what? Where are you? Actually, he's not even looking for a 1200. He's looking for a tag because mm. the guy, the Ara, sounds like he's like, you know. That, that he's already got services. Already got services, right? right. And so we're going to climb and we're going to stay with you. And he's and like, I don't have a tag. I, I don't have. I, he's looking all over his scope. Where? And so that's. And that. so he says, and I always thought this was bad too. You are more than southwest of Van Nuys. You are in the valley between over Calabasas now. You're not just southwest yeah, of, yeah. of Van Nuys, but but that's what he says. And then um, and then it, it go it go ahead and it's close enough for us though. Right, right. Go ahead and play that, Lennon. Uh, just west of Van Nuys, to Ecuador. Okay, so at this point, and I left it out of the video, I think, because it just it just didn't work originally. But Ara is is climbing, and he is in this beautiful left hand turn, and we can start to see on the left side of the screen there in the ADSB exchange where he's starting this left hand turn of um, which he would normally do to follow the Ventura Freeway to get to um, to, to get to Camarillo. But it was at this point. Um, just a couple seconds after this, uh, where the controller comes back over and says, uh, 72 Echo X-ray ident, and he says it with a real ident, like, like who are you? Like, just which makes sense. He's just trying to confirm, like, who are you? Okay. Um, as he's starting to turn uh, uh, left, he's kind of got everything under control, sort of. He, he's probably very, very nervous, and he's a slight left-hand turn, and he's climbing to 4,000 feet. And at this point, the radar controller says, 72 Echo X-ray, ident. And this is what Ara has to do. Go ahead and play that. Controller then asks the pilot to ident. This means the pilot actually... And so he has to turn around and look left, which you can pause it right there. On an S-76, there's a lot going on on there. This isn't a Bell 206. There's right. a lot going on. And there has been many a research out there that just says turning to your left yes. to change a radio, in this case to turn the dials on his transponder, can be enough to turn that, move that stick just ever so slightly and your brain doesn't feel it because right. you're in what? What's the word? Somatographic. Somatographic, Lennon. <laughs> you're having this illusion that you're flying a certain way, but you don't feel yourself turning. And it is at this point that this turn gets out of control further down the Ventura freeway. And so um, I think I might have unfairly in the video knocked the controller for asking him to ident. But in all fairness, I don't, the controller didn't know this guy was having an emergency. Well, right? yeah, that, that, that's true. And the ident is going to be the number one, if I can say that, a choice for most controllers on 
trying to locate the aircraft right. for radar identification purposes, but right? But it's the last thing in the pilot, right? Aviate, navigate, communicate. That's it's right. the last thing for mm -hmm. them. But the, the 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 radar controller doesn't know that he's even having an emergency because R didn't say Mayday, double IMC, declaring an emergency, I'm climbing. Like, I need flight follower, I need your services. Yeah. He didn't say any of that. Could we assume that is because he doesn't want to get the passengers upset? That's possible. And so I wonder, I, I've, I've tried to look up and see what is the setup on their aircraft. Do they have the ability to isolate front to back is Kobe sitting here listening to this the whole time right. on his headset. Yeah. Um, it, I think that that that's got to play a role. Um, I don't believe, I don't agree with the investigators in that Ara was trying to, um, by taking the flight in the first place that he felt pressure from Kobe. I don't, yeah. I don't believe yeah. in that. And even their psychologist didn't agree with it. Uh, um, or one of the investigators didn't agree with them. They argued about it during that meeting, and I, I, I played that in the original video. Okay, so we are Ara has just now made this left hand turn, and it's 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 getting out of control because he's not he's not following his path. Right, right. He's been he he got most likely confused himself, got distracted by turning down to ident. He's turning a little too far left, uh, and he makes uh, one more piece of contact with SoCal. Go ahead, Lennon. Two Echo X-ray. Yeah, you're uh, selling a 1200 code. Uh, are you requesting flight following? Yes, sir. Two Echo x Okay, so now we know that that controller did not know what was going on. Did, did not, but... Not that he should have, I, but... I want to make a comment because yep. he asked the aircraft to ident for the purposes of radar identification. Right. In, the, in the questioning by the NTSB, someone asked in the party, did you intend to use um, position correlation as radar identification method? That's a, a different method. An ident method is a beacon method. Position correlation is a primary radar identification method. Right. Different. I don't know why that question was asked because it was clear that the controller was using the ident as the means of identifying. Right. So when 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 the controller, so we it, it, the notion of radar identification, we got to spend a minute to talk about this as a controller, as an air traffic controller. The minute that controller sees that ident and his eyes go to that ident, he tells the airplane, "Oh, you're still on a 1200 code. You're telling the pilot, I see you." Now, the notion of what the controller used in the interview of saying, I didn't issue radar contact, that is not the point. You inform the pilot that he's radar identified, okay? Mm -hmm. And if that is the is not written anywhere, but if we could have a conversation about that, if that's the line of demarcation of when you're providing services and, and that, that's the time that it starts, that is arguable because that aircraft is now identified as far as the control. He's got all he needs. He right. just hasn't informed the pilot. So the point is, is that when the aircraft says he's climbing to 4,000, do we see, observe that the airplane is actually descending? Right, okay. right. That, yeah. So. Ab absolutely. So go go ahead and uh, for, further play the one on the left too, Lennon. Two echo x ray, what do you say intention? Uh, we climb in to 4,000. Okay, echo pause that. Okay, now on the left, when he gets right over that Agura Road, pause it. Right over that U. Keep going. Okay. Peter, I think all this comes down to this picture. Mm -hmm. On the right, the controller is trying to figure out what's going on. And in a minute, you'll hear him again after the aircraft has already crashed, say that you're too low for flight following. Aura at this point on the right is saying that I'm trying to, I'm climbing to 2,000 feet. Now they're, 4, they're oh, I'm sorry, uh, to 4,000 feet. Now their altitude going through this valley was somewhere around 12, 13, 1400 feet. And so you see he, what he did climb up and got to 2125. Almost. 
Almost. And 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 I believe in the NTSB report said that he was nearly four. He was forty feet from whatever the weather was showing as the as, as as the top of the top of the clouds. But at this point, again, me sitting in the basement, <laughs> staring at the computer. He's flying at one hundred and fifteen knots, and the he is at twenty one twenty five. He says he's climbing to four thousand. The controller is under the impression that he cannot flight follow him because he's too low. Let him go ahead and play that at one time speed and let's watch that altitude. And at that point, he's descending. I can see it. You can see it. Lennon back there can see it. And he's continuing to descend until he makes impact with the side of that mountain at, at 1,500 feet. Why did the radar controller not see that? I believe he was asked that question. Um, and the answer is interesting. And I want to make a, a comment here about the air traffic controllers um, because their involvement, the way it stands right now, was they did all the things that they were supposed to do. The controller here had no obligation yet to, to echo x-ray. The communications from the pilot caused some confusion by the air traffic controller. And then finally, when we saw the ident, it's clear that the controller saw the ident, does he have an obligation to see that the airplane is descending? And the answer is he doesn't. So what is his ability to see that the aircraft is descending? Well, because he had taken his attention off the target and not looking at the target, right? So th those questions were not really um, exposed. They, was, they were not asked of the controller. Sure. But, but there is something that really could have definitely been different with the second controller. And that is if he had already had a tag on the aircraft, already had the aircraft radar identified because our data shows that radar or surveillance, that's the proper surveillance. term, surveillance data using ADSB was never lost. That was pointed out. Mm -hmm. The NTSB did a great job of framing the, the wonderful data provided by ADSB, but the controllers were left in the dark. They were left now. They didn't know. They did not know. The F, did, did the So this is an FAA requirement, the ADSB thing. That's right. right. Did the FAA, do you know or do you believe that the FAA informed all of these controllers and provided the education and training about this system prior to its implementation date of January 2nd? I'm almost positive that they did not. Um, I, from talking to other controllers um, that were working other facilities around the country, there was not one of them that... Um, they could barely spell ADSB. Mm. ADSB. How, how do you so. roll out a, a requirement that is so big like that and not tell the people who are most um, who who have the most to lose if they don't know what they're looking well, at? That's it. And there's other uh, issues as well because we're talking about uh, working air airplanes into airports where there's a mixed environment where there's not a requirement to have ADSB, but you have to. You, you don't have a beacon and how do you, how do the airplanes see each other? Right. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about with your eye, but right, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about instrumentation, right? N none of that was talked about. None of that stuff was discussed. And so I don't know whether the FAA thought that they just li leave that to the controllers themselves, but they were so focused on the minutia of the orders and getting, you know, your ADSB appears inoperative, that, that sort of nonsense. Mm. And, and, and it was really, quite frankly, I had so many questions. And because again, I followed ADSB right up to, and, and I, I, the day that it happened, uh, you know, that it occurred January 2nd, the controllers were left not knowing what they were looking at and what the improvement in their They surveillance. showed up to work and every, they thought everything was the same. They didn't know the airspace requirements. Mm, so yeah. if we if we were to look at the FARs, which we can do, but I don't think we need to do it for this broadcast, it talks about transponder, 
and mode C requirements for operation 10,000 feet and above. And the regs are written very similarly, if not identical, for ADSB. So let, 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 let's, let, let's finish out the video. I think we know how it ends, but in case people didn't watch the first video, go ahead and play that, Lennon, and we'll see what the last communication was. And then what are you going to do when you get to altitude? Or two echo x-ray. You're uh, still too low level uh, for uh, flight following at this time. Two echo x-ray. So, so at, at this point, the aircraft has crashed, um, and the, the data tells us that they were almost pointed directly down when they when when our impacted. This was an instantaneous death for everybody on board, um, and and absolutely tragic. Uh, nine total people, right? Uh, eight people in the back. Okay, so fast forward uh, to uh, they start investigating this uh, right away, and at least you know i've i've done maybe 30 30 of these stories so far and when i read these things it normally takes 2 to 3 years in some cases there one of those ones in california um uh, uh in the in the uh, in in the central part of the state i mean it took almost 4 years to get some for them, for, for yeah. a fatal ems helicopter crash uh this was done in 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 less than 2 years and you got nine fatalities on board you've got a celebrity um you've got children and uh, uh in a heavily populated area. I mean, not exactly where the crash was, but you're in Los Angeles. Um, so there's there's a lot of stakeholders, I, I guess, and maybe that's why it got done so quickly. But you got to think that the NTSB would have put their, you know, do they, do, I wonder if they look and go, we want our top, you know, like in Raiders of the Lost Ark, top men. We want we want our top men on this uh, or, or women, whoever. Um, and so they, they, they do the investigation and it's in, in in the investigation, or at least in the final report, there's no mention about uh, the radar controllers or any of the issues that we're talking about at all. Um, but buried in the investigative attachments and addendums and stuff like that, there's transcripts, and we see uh, the NTSB uh, doing interviews with all of the controllers. They interviewed the yes. Van Nuys, the mm -hmm. Burbank, Burbank, and yep. then the SoCal controllers. Uh, they interviewed all of them. Right. And and to me, at least that's where things popped up where I first started to see uh, issues with what I thought with um, uh, the checklist and the transitioning from one controller to right. the other. Uh, and it just seemed like there was some confusion there and they, they weren't really on the same page. And it kind of seemed like the two controllers were kind of covering for each other, at least with the checklist thing. At least that's what it, what it seemed like to me. Uh, but I think I realize now that maybe the, the checklist was was not as relevant to this situation right. as possible uh, as 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 maybe uh, I thought, but it still seemed like it was not done according to the book. It it was at Burbank and it was at Van Nuys, but it didn't seem like it was with uh, with SoCal. Um, and so that's what I did the story on. But now with all this information that you're telling me, why was there? You have an NTSB. Who works for the federal government? They're they're not the FAA. They are they are an advisory uh, uh, board, right. basically, mm -hmm. right? They do not regulate or set law, right? Uh, but they are federal, right? They right? Make recommendations to the FAA right. and other right. agencies. Yep. And Maritime. so they are sitting there, and there's probably there's an FAA person that's a party to this investigation by by law or they yes, have to be there they have if, to be if there aviation for, is involved that's right correct. and so there's an faa person there but the ntsb is running it and they're sitting there and they're talking uh, like a board style interview almost there's got to be seven eight people around a table and the controller comes in and they say what's your name tell us about your background and they ask them questions right nowhere in these transcripts do they bring up adsb Nowhere in the news reports, in the media, in, uh, in, in hell, in social media, I have not seen anything anywhere that talks about any of this because I didn't realize that flight radar on my phone and that this ADSB was this completely separate technology. And I want to know if I can see this and I can see exactly the spot over a Gura Road where they where Ara stopped ascending and started to descend. If I can see it in real time, 
And those radar controllers should have been able to see it, but due to a lots of miscommunication, didn't know, didn't weren't aware something. Why did the NTSB not talk about that? It's it's a mystery. That's the um, the un, unanswered question. And and quite frankly, you had when you did the first video all the info you needed because putting two and two together. And I'm not sure why it took me. Maybe it was the um, convergence of following ADSB that it became obvious to me. But you saw the aircraft all the way. Okay. Right. So if you saw it, chances are the controller saw it. So why did the controller refuse or not provide the first SC the, fir the first one? Not provide service because he said, I'm going to lose you on radar. He said, because he didn't say. Because he's been saying it for seven years. That's right. And so, right? so that wasn't, that was, it's unresolved. And I, in all the investigations that I've ever done, we would never leave something unresolved like that. A statement not resolving to the data. They have to match. And when they don't match, there's got to be a reason for it. Right now, the, now the so the NTSB. Let him pull up that spreadsheet. The NTSB would not reference adsbexchange.com. They've no. got their own stuff, and so I've got this spreadsheet here. That's right. That is an ATC factual report, which is part of the investigation. That's right. Right. Okay. So at this point, when we look at the time. Um, where's the time over there? So it's it's it and it's in Zulu time, but it says seventeen forty five fifteen, right? Yes. And if I go ahead and play that, and go ahead and let it play, Lennon, and we're playing at, at in real time. Okay. It's giving me about every two seconds over there. That's right. It's giving me a data point. It's flying. They're flying straight down now. 1,800 feet, 1,600, 15, at, at wicked speed, 158, 160 knots, they make impact. And they make impact um, the last, on this website, this public website, is 1745.31. Now we go back over to the spreadsheet, Lennon, and this is a part of the investigation. And we go all the way down to the bottom, Lennon. Is that 17, that's 1745, so I might have said that wrong earlier where that was... 06, 174536, the official NTSB. This was a part, this was attachment five. That's right. To the air traffic control factual report that that is on the public docket on the right. online. There's no freedom of information request. This isn't a secret document or anything like that. That shows the, the data points and everything that you guys see going to the right of this is the ADSB data points. That's right. That some computer then computes and interprets and spits up that purple aircraft on the ADSB exchange website. That's right. And that the 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 uh not graph but the video replay that you played is also represented on the NTSB website but it's right. it appears a little bit different but it, mm -hmm. it absolutely corroborates this information along with what you did on a public website. It's right. identical. So if we go back to uh let in the video uh and, and We'll, we'll kind of close out with this because this is, you oh. know, really wants your opinion. If we go back to uh, where the the controller at 3312, this SoCal controller says, I'm going to lose radar on you and probably comms, so just squawk VFR. At this point, if this controller had the education and the knowledge and the information from his superiors through his chain of command – which he, sh which I would, I would argue he should have, since this was a requirement on January second. It's now January twenty sixth. Had he had that training and education, would he have made that statement? And if he didn't make that statement, and he knew that the information about ADSB, would the outcome have been different? Well, I contend that he couldn't have made that statement. Number one, and how could the outcome have been different? Well, there's a number of ways. First of all, if he doesn't say, I'm going to lose you on radar and comms. Now, comm is a different subject. But if, I'm, if, I, if I know that I have new surveillance coverage by this new thing called ADSB, new to him, right? Not new to the system, mm -hmm. but new to him, he would want to have either, he would have had 25 days of experience 
first of all, right? right, he, right. May have, he might have already known something, right? But this may have been his first encounter. Hey, let's see if I can track this guy. So he might have said yeah, something. Yeah, almost like, let, let me use this new toy. Right. Right? Hey, uh, I've got a new surveillance system. I might lose you if you if I, if I do, if no transmissions hurt, you know, for one minute or uh, something of that nature, then radar service is terminated. You know, s something of that nature or some guidance given by supervision that this is what we should do when we're experimenting, trying to, you know, explore new areas of coverage. Because one thing is for sure, he said his workload in his complexity was two out of five. By order, he is required to provide service under those circumstances, okay? So if he can surveil the aircraft and communication, the only evidence that we have that's empirical right now is that we did hear the aircraft when he called us the second time, whether he was just sitting there not talking to anybody, we'll never, we don't know that, right? Mm -hmm. But he could have been talking to air traffic control all the time. It could have changed the whole scenario completely as far as Ara's willingness to say, finally, hey, I, I've, got an, I've got an encounter with IMC or I, that's speculation on my part. But here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make that is, I think, very important. That if the controller, number one, would have been providing surveillance, we know that he would not have lost surveillance, right? Wait, because he didn't. So that would have been a requirement, which is what you were talking about with your checklist. It had been a requirement for him to br brief his relief as mm. the second controller came in and said, he could have said, hey, 7-2 Echo X-ray, you know, I don't know if I'm going to have him on calm. He's intermittent calm or he's on frequency, but I've got a tag on him. I, in other words, I identified him. I'm, he's still going to stay low and we're going to check out and see if we can see him. Right. And, and the answer would have been, yes, we can see him. Right. So the second aircraft, a second aircraft, the second controller would not have to go through the rigmarole of asking him 30 questions and, and do I have to identify? He wouldn't have to reach back and, and reach back and, and, and turn to the left and identify. Yep. And I did, you know, the point that you made, which is a possibility, it's still somatographic illusion. But the point is, is that none of that would have been necessary had the second tr controller already had identification on that aircraft, been working the aircraft. And if he would have called the controller and said, hey, I'm climbing a 4,000, then he would have been obligated to tell the control uh, the pilot, hey, I'm showing you descending. So that's how the outcome could have been different. Right. It's because we didn't know enough as the controllers that I have a new surveillance system that that is new to the system here at SCT. I got to find out where and where I do not have coverage. And so he would have been following him. And at this point over here, where there, go back over there, Agura Road, Lennon, had that previous communication not have gone that way, and he would have said, oh, well, I got this new, I got ADSBs here, so I'm not going to lose this guy. No, yeah. And he could have been paying attention uh, and watching him and following him. He would have in, uh, uh, informed his relief of what's going on, yeah. of, of who the guy is. And then at this point over Agura Road, and this is the last big, big thing I want you to confirm, as an air traffic controller, he knows that this guy is going to Camarillo. That's right. Right? Even though this is not an instrument flight, he he's told him that that's where I'm going. That's correct. And he said, all he, he has said, I'm climbing to 4,000 feet. When I can see that he's turning too far to the left and descending, what would that controller in real life say if he saw that this per that Aro was going too far to the left and descending, what would he have said over the radio? I'm showing you descending. And Aura would do what? Look at his instruments and go, oh who, shit. Who knows? I, yeah. And 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 straighten it out because he's not even thinking that because he's uh, he's spatially disoriented at that point and he thinks he's flying straight when he's flying straight into the ground. Justin, let me make a comment because I know I'm going to get pushed back from some air traffic controllers, and I want to explain my answer there. Because what is published in the book clearly does not give the controllers the ammunition or the, the, the things they need to prevent something like this from happening. It's called a terrain obstruction 
alert, which is a safety alert, one of two safety alert a controller has to issue, right? Mm. And that phraseology that's mandated is low altitude alert, check your altitude immediately, the MIA, the the, the IFR, th these are all IFR terms that the FAA gives us, not not germane to a VFR flight, but but I don't think that would have helped Ara at all because he knows he's low for crying out loud, right? Right? He's, he's he doesn't. Yeah, I, yeah, I get it. I'm low. I, he's I, probably I, I got things beeping at him already he, that he's ignoring. Well, yeah, right? he didn't have jip was, you know, so that was another issue that ground proximity warning system. But so so, but 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 the issue is is that these phraseologies would not have helped. And this is the mandated phraseology. But if I show, if a, a pilot tells me he's climbing and I see that he's descending, I would just simply say, and I'll say, I'll make it my opinion. And I, I think I'll have some people agree with me, I hope. Hey, I'm showing you descending. All right. Are you sure you're climbing? Or right. something of that nature. I'm showing you descending. So that's a big part of crew resource management uh, is, is an assertive statement, which is not not vague, which is exactly what you're saying. I mean, you remember the L-1011 crash and That's the Eastern Airlines crash where a lot of this comes from, where the uh, uh, tower controller in that case, they're descending. They're supposed to be circling at 2,000 feet. They're descending and the controller, instead of saying, you're descending, says, hey, how's it, how are you guys doing out there? You guys doing all right? And just leaves it at that. Uh, as opposed to what you're saying, I'm showing you're descending. Do you do you see that as well on Something your end? Of that. Some yeah. type of agree. That's an assertive. That's a, a built into crew resource management. That's an assertive statement. That's right. And and I think that along with all, that in itself could have changed the outcome. There's three or four things that those one things could have changed the outcome. Ara declaring an emergency. Ara turning around back at Glendale. Yeah. Yeah, could, would have changed of, this whole of, thing. Of course. You know, the thing that is really provocative uh, to me in the first thing I thought of is when the controller said, I'm going to lose you on radar, and the evidence showed that it didn't, why was there no questioning at all done on that? There was no, you know, why did you feel that? Well, how, you know, the, the, the data shows that didn't happen because it the, the, the controller, the first controller, if he knew that, would have been required that, but but by by the FAA mm -hmm. orders to provide that service, right? So why do you think the NTSB didn't didn't ask? I have no idea. Why do you think I, there's a conflict of interest between um, an FAA rep in the room of, of some sort, an NTSB investigator, and the, who's the who who strokes the check for the controllers? Does it say FAA on it? Yeah, yeah. and the, and an FAA employee being being um, in, interviewed uh, w where there's potential uh, some type of gap that that that's there. Do you think there's a conflict of interest um, that led to that th that line of questioning being omitted? You know, um, rather than speculate, let me just say that that shouldn't be because the job of an air safety investigator is to look at the evidence agree on the evidence that uh, what we're looking at and to resolve disparities. This was the disparity that was not resolved. It was not, it was, it, 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 uh, that's as much as I can say about it. I mean, that's as much as anyone can say about it. If I was in that room, I, I mean, I would have asked that question mm -hmm. and I would have had another whole line of questions to ask both controllers, but I, I don't have that opportunity. We, 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 are speculating on sure. certain things, right? We are. We, we, your audience realizes that, but we're both outcome driven people and we don't want this happening again. I right. don't want controllers to be left in the dark and, and, and they continually are. Um, uh, another great example of that, and we can do this in another show, is what they put out about emergency auto land. It's a convergence of three wonderful technologies, which is going to save lives, but the controllers did not get a, a great briefing. It wasn't thought all the way through. And so therefore we are left with possibilities of having a negative outcome. In my SMS book says, if I can draw, put pen to paper and, and take away risk, I do that. Mm -hmm. So, that and so, and so uh, following the pilot 
line of things. I've already beat up Aura enough. Yeah. Uh, um, crew resource management, uh, 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 two pilots, better recurrent training on on I, invert and IMC and right. autopilot. Those are all things the pilot uh, and, and better communication the pilot could have done. And we've already talked about what the controllers could have done better. But it really on the on the ATC side of things. This seems to go so much further up. It does. That this is an, a systemic FAA issue that led to these poor dudes down in LA who didn't realize they had the resources to help somebody. And now they've got to go home every night and know that nine people died where they uh, there's a question of whether or not they could have changed the outcome had they had the correct information. So is the problem solved now? Is it, Did how could it be solved? Because they didn't even ask about it in the investigation. Has the FAA acknowledged this was an issue? Has anybody acknowledged? Have you no. asked any of these folks no. uh, about any of this? And, and you know, the sad part of it is, is uh, this didn't serve as any kind of catalyst to get in gear um, uh, training that was supposed to either have happened or it, I, I don't know what training was supposed to have happened, but I've got an article that we pulled from an ATO minute, which is a, a FAA uh, uh, article that s claims the COO of the mm -hmm. organization at that time said the air traffic controllers had received training. Well, if it's the training that we and the controllers actually got, that was not substantive training. Again, that was administrative and that was not going to help our right. or or, the, or Kobe or anyone else in that regard but the real training still hasn't come out so controllers are still no the it's it's 2000 what was the date it's I, it's may of 2023 so like, to give you an example and this is something that i'm sure there's a percentage a high percentage of controllers that don't even realize that there are two kinds of ADSB systems that are in the United States and we're the only country that has it and why? Mm -hmm. Why do we have two? Why do we need two? Well, it's because the FAA was very smart in this regard. They said, hey, if we want you to equip your aircraft, you know, they were getting pushback. If you are an aircraft right, owner- It's going to cost money. Yeah. It's going to cost money. <laughs> yeah. I, we I got another- Hey, the, the twin pilot, uh, 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 HTAWS, uh, um, night vision goggle thing oh, yeah. with helicopter EMS. Right. I mean, that's always the first response. I've got a great quote from a, a CEO of an aviate of a helicopter EMS company in California years ago when they crashed in the dark and, and, uh, when it came to, uh, HTAWS was not required back then. Yeah. Uh, and he was quoted as, you know, kind of chuckling and saying, <laughs> you know, you, you, we can't afford. We, we can't. You can't afford, it's going to cost millions of, of dollars. Put us out of business. We're, we're, and now HTAWS is required right. on on all Part One Thirty Five, uh, at least EMS helicopters. Um, but this issue has has gone unresolved. Uh, it it, se it seems at least the, the the training coming down and the proper communication of of these uh, air traffic controllers. But man, we've covered a lot of ground, dude. I know. Uh, you flew a long way to. Uh, to tell a pretty good story, and and I think that um, I think that I'm glad that you did. I I um, I don't think that there's too many people that could look up this on their own. You say it's putting two and two together. I think it's more like doing a calculus equation. But once <laughs> once you you get to the end, to me, I mean, I'm I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and so I see where you're coming from, though, and it, it's blatantly obvious now. Oh my God this happened and it happened and it didn't need to for a multitude of reasons. And while most people out there, I think, believe that uh, they just blame a stupid pilot for making right. a stupid error, which is what people always do in these incidents is when, when it's far more complicated, when the Swiss cheese, when they don't understand the Swiss cheese model and say, oh, it's pilot error, nothing else. Well, no, it is much more else. And it oftentimes is, um, and the only positive that really should come out of a failure of the Swiss cheese model uh, is learning from that mistake and moving forward, like you said, having some kind of outcome. And with a lot of these other helicopter incidents that I talk about, most of the time, it has led to a change, uh, whether it's night vision goggles or, or HTAWs or helmets. I mean, good God, they used to wear helmets back back in the day sure. for for paramedics and nurses to crew resource management to uh, to all kinds of things. Uh, but in this case, 
it seems like there has been nothing that has moved forward uh, because the, cit the, the citation that one sees when they go online of what was the cause of this accident was a bad decision by a pilot. That's right. A, a crappy SMS at the company um, and some type of self-induced pressure to impress Kobe. And only one of those, I believe in. I think the pilot made a bad decision. I don't think the SMS had anything to do with it. And I don't think trying to impress Kobe had anything to do with it. I do, though, uh, agree that maybe he was a little, Aura was a little uh, coy in his radio communication because if Kobe's wearing a headset, I could understand, I don't want to say emergency on the radio with my client in the back, that kind of thing. But I don't think that that, that Kobe being his client had anything to do with him taking the flight in the first place. But I, I digress on that. Uh, but like I said, we've covered a lot of ground and I'm glad you came out. Um, I appreciate your time and, and, uh, and, 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 and all the, uh, en energy that, that, that you've put, that you've put into this. And, uh, uh, hopefully we get to do it again one day. Yeah. Thank you. It's a story that really needed to be told. Um, I've sat on it for a while and wanted to make sure that uh, it uh, it got out. And yeah. your platform, when I saw the first video, I said, "This is this is it. This is the place to go." Well, I hope the right people listen, and and I hope it leads to change. And uh, we'll do it again. Okay. I appreciate the time. Thank you.